Lori, did you want me to start so you can? Yeah. Um, yeah, if you want to take over, that would be great. Okay. I'm going to, I'll keep at admitting people okay. and okay. monitor email. Okay, thank you guys. Um, I'm going to quit put in the chat uh, our coordinated campaign committee website for anybody who's interested. The coordinated campaign committee hosts these monthly webinars. Our uh, work involves, uh, we're a standing committee of the uh, Green Party. We cooperate with state and local parties to help coordinate and support federal, state, and local Green Party electoral campaigns. We also help track candidates and office holders. Uh, we try to facilitate uh, discussion of electoral strategy. Years ago, we had a political director that conducted campaign schools and did a lot of work in the committee since we don't have one and aren't likely to see one in the near or possibly all future, we, we've taken that on. Uh, our members have conducted uh, these monthly webinars, mostly monthly webinars, uh, involving all aspects of campaigns, uh, roughly running along the campaign year calendar, but not always. This one is a little bit of a different thing. We like to add uh, some new and, and um, uh, material that, that other parties aren't gonna be able to provide. Uh, we also um, have a yearly uh, funding application. We don't have a lot of money to give out, but we invite candidates to apply for uh, limited funds, maybe anywhere from 100 to 500 bucks uh, for a few campaigns. And then we like to help promote with videos and live streams and, and stuff so we can help um, promote and publicize Green Party candidates. Uh, a couple of our former co-chairs have done some in-person campaign schools and we've hosted campaign school workshops at some of the national meetings. Uh, last year, we conducted a virtual campaign school for Oregon it went pretty well and we have all of that material or most of it still available in case anybody wants to check it out or have a repeat. Um, we help uh, maintain the, the database, which is uh, a more formal listing of uh, candidates and elected office holders. Uh, but we also uh, wanna keep current candidates that may or may not be on the ballot yet, but we keep, keep, a, uh, keep a prize of anything that's uh, in the offing. And, uh, if any of you are aware of candidates in your state, uh, whether you think we know about them or not, feel free to write to ccc at gp.org and just let us know. Uh, we also have a list of state liaisons whose job it is to do that and in the process of finalizing an update of that. If you're not sure about that and want to know, please contact us. We can help you set something up if you don't have anything else. Um, so we'd just like to invite, this is a little bit of a new and different thing, but we have uh, Echo Action Committee who is uh, offered to do this special training tonight. Uh, thanks to Mark Dunley, the co-chair, uh, also featuring Nor uh, Tony Ndege from North Carolina Green Party and uh, gubernatorial Texas candidate from Del Delilah Barrios, uh, Green Party candidates in, uh, in Pe uh, Pennsylvania, Kearney Warren and members uh, Maureen Doyle uh, we're all going to speak tonight about campaign uh, uh, environmental policy that candidates can use as their campaigns. So, uh, Ellen Hillary has mentioned uh, that she's put in the application for candidate support. Uh, you can please uh, fill it out if you're running and share it with all of your friends who are running. The deadline to apply is August 27th. So, let's uh, see, have I left anything out? I don't think so. So, I will turn it over to uh, Echo Action co chair Mark Dunley. We're going to hear about environmental policy that you can use in your uh, campaign and uh, hopefully be elected and put it into play. Mark, thank you. Thank you. Um, trying to figure out why this uh, thing isn't moving. Well, there it goes. Um, so I'm co-chair of the Eco Action Committee and uh, on the screen right now is sort of the duties of, of the committee. And one of them is to try to help inform and advise Green Party candidates on, you know, environmental issues, um, ecological issues. And so we sort of uh, put together this for, for little presentation tonight to talk about some of the things we've already have done as candidates ourselves, um, but really wanted to, to open up the second half to get uh, feedback, brainstorming questions from um, candidates, campaign manager, campaign workers about ways that we could possibly um, help uh, in that effort. And we will, um, you know, try to accommodate that. Um, one of the things I, I, I want to talk about myself, um, I, I have been running 
uh, as a third party candidate initially with the Citizens Party and then more recently with the Green Party since um, 1982. And I've managed uh, two uh, presidential campaigns, about I think three or four gubernatorial campaigns, and then a bunch of United States Senate and, and congressional campaigns. Um, so I'm also very happy to talk to people um, who have particular questions about campaign management, um, but also the um, particularly as related to environmental issues. I was Jill Stein's campaign manager um, when she ran for, for president last time. I was a climate coordinator in her first campaign. And I've been Howie Hawkins campaign manager a number of times. And uh, I was his campaign manager in 2010 when we first launched uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, two years ago, I ran as the Green Party candidate for uh, state controller. And one of the main reasons I did that is I had been uh, for about five years at that point, six years, been coordinating the campaign in New York State and New York City to get the state and New York City pension funds to divest from fossil fuels. Um, I, mainly, I started that on behalf of 350NYC, which is part of the 350.org uh, uh, movement. Uh, we actually been successful, uh, both New York City and New York State uh, have agreed to divest New York State's a little bit slower. Um, those are the second and third largest public pension plans uh, in the United States. The um, state controller pension plan was, uh, I think, about $220 billion, which about mm, maybe $12 or $13 billion invested uh, in fossil fuels. And, and the entire reason I rent, well, besides we need to run and get 50,000 votes for governor, um, uh, my campaign was really focused on the divestment issue. And so I, I, I look for a lot of ways to try to um, use the divestment issue to, to mobilize supporters. Uh, here's a couple of um, palm cards that we handed out to people about the campaign, um, focusing up both on the uh, state controller race, but, but also on the divestment issue and asking people to call Tom DiNapoli. Uh, one of the things we, we ended up doing um, was I think every Tuesday after Labor Day, Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, we had people call in to uh, Tom DiNapoli's office. And, and actually, it seemed to generate about 100 calls, uh, and that was quite helpful. Drove Tom DiNapoli crazy, and we did manage to get into um, one of the two debates uh, that they had for, for state controller. Um, and, and we use it as a, uh, you know, an informational um, tool. Uh, one of the other things I mentioned, Howie and I had started the Green New Deal um, back in 2010. We tried to put a lot of that into the 2018 gubernatorial. He was our gubernatorial candidate and I was a controller candidate. This is something we did, uh, I think the day after Earth Day, um, about 2000 people came to the state capitol. We were not one of the main organizers. We were certainly one of the organizers, but not the lead organizer. Uh, both Howie and I got uh, arrested that day along, along with Gloria Matara, who is our state party co-chair. I see Gloria is on our uh, call at the moment. In one of the races, Gloria was our lieutenant governor candidate when Howie was running um, for that. Uh, but we did look um, at various ways to, to bring the climate issue on. One of the things that I had done uh, also successful on this one was that uh, Governor Cuomo, the state capital complex in Albany, New York, uh, has been heated by steam for 100 years, and they include this steam plant in a very low-income African-American neighborhood. And I have been involved 30 years previously in defeating the state uh, when they operated a garbage incinerator uh, at this site in order to heat the state complex. Um, and then the governor came in with an $88 million proposal uh, to build two new frack, two frack gas turbines. Um, Howie, in his 2010 campaign, had kicked off the campaign to um, ban fracking in New York State. Uh, he was attacked for being too radical, for calling for a ban on fracking by all the big environmental groups who only would support a moratorium. 
Um, but in 2015, we got the governor to do that. So while we have banned the burning of frack gas in New York State, we import a tremendous amount of frack gas from Pennsylvania. And he wanted to spend $88 million to put two new gas turbines in here so we could expand uh, into a microgrid and produce electricity. We had about a two year campaign, um, basically got the state legislature to amend the annual budget. And so they said the $88 million could only be spent for 100% uh, renewable energy, and then as my son calls the punk rock band, to the extent possible. And so we're still fighting what to the extent possible means. But this is a press conference that we held um, at the uh, steam generating facility. And particularly this gentleman here uh, is quite progressive. Uh, he was the co-chair of the um, group that was fighting the uh, issue. And he was actually a Democratic uh, elected official, the county legislator who represented that district. And he was willing to come out and join Howie and I and basically endorse uh, our campaign. One of the few Democratic Party officials uh, in the state um, to, to do that. Um, so one of the things we, you know, and actually I did this last um, year, um, I did write um, some press releases about climate change and then try to get climate, can I'm sorry, green congressional candidates to take quotes in it. Um, a few of them used the model. We're willing to do that again this year. Um, we could uh, also pick out individual issues like garbage incineration and do a, you know, Green Party opposes garbage incineration and then take quotes from any of the candidates who run in against garbage incineration. And we could do it on any other myriad of climate um, uh, issues. One of the things that Howie suggested, um, and I wrote to him about this event and see what thoughts he had. And one of his suggestions was that we could help people develop a plan for local and state action on, on climate change. Howie and I did this when we were running for statewide office. A lot of focus on public power. Uh, one of the big, big problems in New York State um, it takes 10 years to build large scale renewables energy. So after 18 years of trying, we only have 5% of the state's electricity coming from wind and solar, and that's not gonna solve the climate change. So one of the things we said, if we had public power and we had the local governments or the state building all this stuff, it would increase the opportunity for public input from the local community who are often the ones who opposed to the siting of the plant. Um, and of course we support public ownership, it's cheaper, and it is more democratic control. And we did try to push for, um, you know, democratic planning. Here were some of the ideas to how we thought if you wanted to do it at a city level, you could talk about the issue of public power, about public transit. A lot of things politicians talks about, you know, electric cars, which are nice, but, you know, public transit is a whole lot better solution, more of a green solution uh, than electric cars. Uh, public housing, I'll actually you say that that's something that Bernie Sanders and uh, AOC have talked a little bit about a Green New Deal for, for public housing. Uh, Howie's proposal uh, as a Green Party presidential candidate in public housing was only about maybe 50 times bigger than what Bernie Sanders was talking about, uh, but at least Bernie helped put it uh, on the line. And we can talk about other things. Here's just something I wanted to point out to people. I was involved with this in the Capital District. Um, more as I was not a lead person on it, but um, a local suburban town developed um, what they call a roadmap for a sustainable future. And it has about 20 different areas and develop recommendations for climate change, mitigation actions, uh, implementation actions. If somebody wanted to develop uh, a green um, climate agenda, you know, for either their city or their county, or even the state, this would be a good place to start because it has a lot of good uh, ideas and then it, it also links you to both research projects that have worked on it, but it also gives you examples of local governments that have already um, you know, implemented it. Um, sort of running out of time before we go to the next speaker. One of the other things Howie did during his gubernatorial campaign, one of his pet projects, um, we should take public ownership of the internet system. The you know instead of having these private corporations determine who provides you know broadband and stuff like that, and the unions liked it because they hated Spectrum 
And so it was a big fight to take over Spectrum by the unions and they supported public power. Um, and it tied into that very well. Here is a piece of literature that, you know, as many people may know, while Howie and other Greens were the first ones to implement the Green New Deal in his 2010 campaign, most people knew it after uh, AOC was elected. Uh, interestingly, um, we had helped a Green Party candidate run for city council in my neighborhood where I was living at the time in Brooklyn. He did quite well. Ashley was cross endorsed by the DSA, got 25% of the vote for city council in New York City. His campaign, man, and we basically educated him on the Green New Deal, which he made part of his campaign. His campaign manager then became AOC's campaign manager when she ran for Congress. She's the one that ran the campaign during the primary. You hear a lot about the Justice Democrats. They didn't take over the campaign operation until she won the primary. But um, And so the Green New Deal that AOC developed came out of the work that we had previously done with this Green Party City Council candidate uh, in the neighborhood. And this is another, um, you know, this nice little logo from the Green New Deal from, from Maryland. Um, oops. Oh, now they're playing hardball. Um, trying to get back to it. really, the, the, the other thing I was just gonna do at the end, um, was there is a lot of information in the uh, Green Party platform. There is a whole, uh, you know, if you go to the platform, there's a sustainability section and it has about 15 or so different uh, Green Party ecological issues. And I often when I'm writing stuff for Howie during his recent presidential campaign, or uh, I did a lot of some of his media, I did a lot of the media for, for Jill, just to take stuff out of the Green Party platform. It's already been debated, it's already pretty well, um, you know, put together and, and just took that and, you know, put it out. Um, one of the other things was there's actually some Green Party campaign literature, uh, including on the Green New Deal on the Green Party website. I've been lobbying the web manager not to hide it under the Green Party store, which is where it is right now on the GP platform. So if you go to store on the GP um, website and you hit store, there's a, then a separate pull down menu for literature. And there's a lot of, you know, a fair amount of good stuff there. Uh, I just think it'd be, let's make it a little bit easier for people to find it. So, I mean, one of the things we want to talk about later, and I'm out of time here, um, is just, you know, besides doing, you know, possibly some joint press releases where we get local Green Party candidates uh, to take a quote, um, you should always be looking at letters to the editor. Um, recycling is a green issue. Every place needs to improve the recycling program. Um, talk to local environmental groups about issues they're already working on. Um, you know, you don't want to steal it from them, but if you amplify what they're doing, you know, that can be quite helpful. I did get endorsed by 350.org and Food and Water Watch when I ran for the state controller candidate because I'd already done a lot of um work on that. You should post your material to the uh, Eco Action Facebook page so that more people uh, see it. And one of the things I was doing, I don't know whether the CCC is already doing this, but perhaps putting out a series of weekly sort of newsletters to um, followers at the Green Party national level, and then highlight two or three candidates, each of those weekly um, emails about how they are working on environmental issues to give you more attention. So we can come back to more discussion about that now, but I want to turn it over now uh, to Tony Nege from, from North Carolina, and I believe he's also bringing in uh, George Friday. So Tony. And How's George. it going? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. You gave a really great overview of Eco Action, Mark. Um, and I invite any of you who are not currently a member and you're green and uh, you just even have a little bit of time um, uh, to join the Eco Action Committee. You, you have to be appointed via your state party, but if, if, if that's not a possibility, you can talk to Mark and we can see how we could um, get you plugged into lots of things that we're involved in, always way more than that we want to do than is possible. Uh, my name's Tony Indege. Um, sort of like you think like reggae. <laughs> um, I'm the uh, uh, one of the co-chairs of North Carolina 
Green Party and uh, outgoing um, recent uh, national co-chair, and I was liaison to Eco Action and Ballot Access. Um, and so um, I wanted to do a, a quick presentation, and I'm not going to be able to get through nearly anything, you know, everything, anything in depth in terms of like a, an actual like training. But um, I did want to touch upon environmental justice and publicly owned energy, which um, uh, Mark Dunley did a, a good job of talking about publicly owned uh, energy. As you, as I mentioned before, I am a uh, from North Carolina, live in North, North Carolina. And um, uh, if anyone's heard of the term environmental racism, um, one of the places this was uh, became a, 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 a term actually um, is was uh, it came out of uh, uh, the protests in the early 80s, 1982, in Warren County, North Carolina, which is one of the five uh, predominantly black um, counties in North Carolina. And uh, they had uh, um, the state of North Carolina had decided to dump uh, PCB uh, filled um, waste into uh, landfills, of course, in uh, predominantly black and rural area. And uh, this set off a fire st storm, really uh, a landmark, um, I think, a protest wave that happened in, uh, in North Carolina, but it, it also inspired lots of protests. We also had uh, black farmers who uh, later on joined uh, struggles against uh, um, some of these same issues as well as uh, discrimination against black farmers. So there's a, 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 you know, George can also touch upon some of these issues, um, but there's been a, a lot of, uh, North Carolina has been like a, a, the center of a lot of um, issues that, that have highlighted um, economic injustice and also uh, environmental racism and uh, ecolo ecological justice. Um, fast forward over 30 years later, we had uh, one of the, the largest coal ash disasters in history um, that occurred in uh, the center of the state, uh, Dan River, over 39,000 tons of uh, coal ash waste and uh, that had all kinds of, um, as you can imagine, um, disastrous chemicals, cancer causing chemicals into um, the Dan River, which does have, um, have water repositories that, that people uh, use drinking water with. So this was a major, major uh, disaster. Uh, no one was arrested, even despite the fact that it, uh, that it was re revealed in trials as well as investigations that Duke Energy had, uh, which is um, trades places as the largest uh, energy company in, in the world, or certainly in the United States, uh, with a couple other co companies every two or three years. So it's pretty much the largest or one of the largest um, and is in several states. And um, so um, it, within these investigations, they found that there's several EPA violations and that there were, this was not the only um, coal ash pond that there were about 33 coal ash ponds, many of which were unsurprisingly in um, areas with, that are rural, poor, and um, have a disproportionately large number of uh, a, a black population. Um, so um, it's very important to look at issues like the, these in your state, in your community, because you'll just uncover, you, if you just start peeling this away, there's so many things, with fracking, there's an issue in Stokes County, uh, County that was right near um, uh, a coal ash pond in, in Blues, Creeks, uh, uh, Blues Creek, which is right near there. So my point is, is that there's plenty of areas in North Carolina that we, you can just kind of like peel away like an onion and find all of these injustices happening that, um, that are crossovers. You know, some people like to use intersectional. I just think that so many of these things are interconnected. So it's very important. Um, I'm gonna be coming from an organizer perspective because before I was a green, I was, for many more years, I was an organizer and activist. And it is very important, even if you're a party, to agi agitate, educate, and organize because we're not one of the, we, we don't take corporate cash, right? So the only way that we can make up for this is, is by doing that. Um, we also need to make connections between environmental justice, socioeconomic justice, imperialism, and war. Um, and we also, uh, candidates 
need to emphasize the necessity for publicly owned and democratically controlled energy production utilities, uh, in my opinion, at least. Um, they, uh, we also need to provide an uncompromising critique of capitalism. So, when, you know, this is why we have another party, because otherwise you're going to be mixed in with a party that, you know, serves Wall Street um, without question. And there's a lot of political confusion if you're talking about, you know, the fact that capitalism is causing all these things and you have the Wall Street pick as the head of your party. So um, it's very important that this political space is opened up for independent movements and that we, we're uncompromising uncom in that um, because that's really uh, beyond anything is, is, in my opinion, the service uh, that we provide uh, to uh, humanity. And I think we're going to historically provide uh, it in the history books. Um, so, so Tony, you wanted to bring in George at some point? Yeah. Yeah, because um, we're, we're, we're running late. Okay. Yes, we right. are, but you know, you took plenty of time, Mark. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah. I, I, we want, we want to leave time for I, questions and answers. We're, from we're almost there. Right. So, um, it's very important for uh, candidates to educate, uh, to, e to educate and organize within their community. And the reason why is because um, several of our, our candidates, for example, uh, Robert uh, Corrier at the, at the top, was an activist for several years. He became a Green, but I got to know him through activism and Occupy and all these things and through protesting uh, these coal ash bills. So he was one of the lead organizers of a, um, a protest against Duke Energy using, um, uh, they're gonna push, do, have rate hikes to um, pay for the coal ash bill because they had, had billions of dollars uh, to clean up um, that they're still cleaning up now. So uh, Robert Corrier was our first, uh, it took us a while to get on, on the ballot. It was the hardest state to get on the ballot. And he was our first candidate, congressional candidate. We also are calling for a moratorium, not just now during the pandemic, but we've been calling for moratorium for all energy shutoffs on top of, um, on top of supporting actually a transition to, just transition to publicly controlled energy. Um, our second, uh, ever um, congressional candidate. He was he here with Hallie Hawkins at Duke Energy headquarters. We had a uh, press conference, uh, was also calling for a Green New Deal and publicly controlled energy. And we coined this phrase that actually, actually a while back, not one more dime Duke, that a lot of folks have been used, uh, have used. Very quickly, I promise I'll be two more minutes, Mark. Um, we have- um, That makes North seven. Carolina. Two more minutes makes seven. I know okay. I'm being rude, but you know, I don't care. Okay, well, we have the Atlantic Coast pi Pipeline um, that w went through some of the poorest areas in North Carolina, including Lumberton, which has the largest uh, um, um, Native American um, indigenous uh, population in North Carolina and in the Southeast. Um, and uh, the term wrong side of the tracks refers to, in many, in many areas, um, the east side of town is, is the area where you find a larger uh, working class population, black, black and brown population. And one of the, there's a historical reason behind this and it, it is because pollution historically and smokestacks were um, because in, in most of the, the nations like the United States, Britain, uh, France, we have westerlies. So the, the, the wind blows from the west to the east typically. So um, the reason why you often find the, the bad side of the railroad tracks is the east side is because of uh, uh, environmental um, uh, discrimination. I, uh, I'm going to leave with this uh, issue, the fact that we, we need to also look at imperialism, the, the, the effects of imperialism. The 10 most food insecure, insecure countries in the world generate less than, you know, basically a, a small percentage of our greenhouse ga uh, gases. Um, however, climate change has led to food insecurity in, in all of these nations. As you all can see, predominantly these nations are in the global south and in Africa, with the exception of Haiti and uh, Afghanistan. So um, this is very um, this is very important to note that we have to address imperialism. Um, and so I'm going to lead off to George Friday, but I just want to say that like we also have to provide a a, a vision for what an eco-socialist society would look like. We've had uh, North Carolina has hosted several uh, and the Socialist Party uh, together uh, locally has uh, hosted several um, 
um, webinars. And some of them we talk about, like what would, an, what would another society look like? What would another, uh, how uh, capitalism, because of its endless growth, um, creates the necessity for this. It's, and growth is, is, a, is intrinsic to capitalism. So with that, um, I'm sorry for the, the, the quick um, overview here, but I did want to give George Friday a chance to speak. She's, um, she's a national organizer with United for Peace and Justice and has been a lifetime organizer as well. She um, ha would, has a wonderful perspective and I just wanted to hear a few words from her. Thank you for joining us. A few words, all right. And I will, I'll try not to be rushed, but I'll try not to take too much time. I can be disciplined and keep comments to three minutes or less. Y'all trip me out. I'm a Green Party member for a long time, but y'all like, let me try to squeeze all this content into no minutes, which is like kind of crazy. Not saying you're <laughs> total respect, but it's a lot. So, all right, y'all, if you're considering running for office, God bless you, go for it. Um, and based on some of what Mark said and what Tony said, in your own community, look for the perfect storm of racism, corporate greed, and political corruption. That is the definition of what happens in North Carolina when it comes to um, environmental racism. Duke Energy, crazy, all the horrible things they've done. Rate hikes when they've got plenty of profit in communities of color doing all kinds of horrible things and ignoring it and the North Carolina elected officials let them get away with it. I'm on the board of Duke, I mean, not Duke Energy, we hate them. I'm on the board of <laughs> NC Warren and NC Warren has caught and exposed Duke Energy countless times. Maybe Kim Porter can put some links or something in the chat to help out with that, but it's there. So based on organizing and as a candidate and as the party, try if you can to make every event activity you do be about building the party and building the movement because that's how we win building the party so we get people that join and building the movement part of doing that isn't necessarily by giving people data and statistics and telling them how horrible things are and boring them to tears not saying y'all were boring but you know not completely scintillating your presentations, but to validate the reality that people are experiencing, you know this right here sucks, here's an alternative, become part of the party, help us build change. There you go, that's the best way to do it. Look for those, the perfect storm, racism, corporate greed, political corruption. Where those come together, those are the folks you reach out to first. They become part of your, your campaign team, they help organize and educate and agitate. The party grows. We win more elections. All is well and right with the world. Peace. Whoever goes next, you're up. Thank, thank you, George. Um, our, our next speaker is Delia uh, Barrios, um, who's a Green Party gubernatorial candidate for Texas. And she joined EcoAction early this year to participate in the forum that we co-sponsored with GPACs around um, the military and its impact on the climate. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Mark. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect when I came tonight. I'm also a delegate for um, the Latinx Caucus. And as Mark mentioned, I'm with GPACs as well. And I think we do a lot of um, good work there. It, as far as my experience goes as a green, uh, I definitely see the concern for challenges presented. We're living in a very, uh, very fast changing world. And I think that this is the right time to bring people to us. If they don't have a home elsewhere, they should at the very least be able to find a home with us. And so um, I understand there's a lot of challenges not only running for office, but getting active within your state party and, and reaching people when y'all are talking about environmental racism and all things that uh, to find people, Texas has checked all those boxes. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we we cannot we have a crisis on all fronts in the state, and so it's it's definitely a struggle. Um, I have no problem, you know, working with other groups. I encourage it. If you find you know socialists in your area, you find Democrats who are willing to 
you know, cross party lines to help out. It's about the people and it's about what they need. And we have to be the ones recognizing it and, and being real about what the situation is and how hard it is all over. So yeah, I, I'm so grateful that everybody's here and they're putting in their time and effort for free to, you know, motivate others to be a part of this party and grow. Um, we can't grow very far unless we have some good roots. And I think Green Party has good roots. They've We've got nothing but activists here and people who care about the environment and people whose fight and struggle is the same as everybody else's. So I'm really happy to be a Green. I definitely have concerns with our structure only because um, it's almost like because we're so small, we're vulnerable at in some respects. And I think it's really important. I think Mark was bringing this up that we stay true to the pillars and we stay true to the values because we can't flex, we can't change those goalposts as a party. We have to stay consistent. So I just think that that's probably one of the most important things. And um, don't be afraid to reach out because you've allies everywhere. We're all over the country, we're all over the world, and there's there's lots of good work to do, and we can get a lot more done together. So thank you for your time. Well, Delana, I'll ask you a quick question. Is there a, an environmental issue or two you were raising in your present campaign? So there's several. We had the winter storm, so public energy is seriously important. We have high COVID numbers, so universal health care is important. We have uh, very, very greedy, corrupt people um, involved with pipelines and um, extractions that are harming the planet and disrupting water resources, which we have some, you know, really beautiful springs and, uh, and nice hill country areas. Basically, every water source of our state has been very close to or actually polluted um, through the oil and gas extraction industry. So I think that uh, it's all over the place. We had petrochemical plants exploding. I mean, there's a lot of things. We lost a fight to Kinder Morgan. And so they, they, I, that was something that I worked pretty hard on. And, and my um, experience as an activist, we went to court many, many times and we, it just, we lost and you could see they were paying out, you know, oh, we're giving donations. Oh, we're doing that. And it's just, it made my heart sick. It made me so disgusted that they could go beyond what the clear conscience of the public is because there were a lot of us there that were protesting and it didn't matter. And I think that that's why what we do here is so important because we need to just, somebody has to be watching all the time and the threats are endless. And we have to we have to just get together to make a difference because, uh, yeah, water resources are being contaminated. People are being sick and exploited. And there's pollution, obviously, aimed at black and brown communities more often than not. So pick one. <laughs> They're all important. We've got, you know, several, several issues that we have to deal with. And uh, I'm sure it's not too different elsewhere. But right now, you know priorities are, are those three things. We got the healthcare problem, we got the um, oil and gas problem, and the water. And the immigration, oh my god, I can't, I'll get angry, so I'm going to stop talking about ICE right now, but that's another issue that we have to deal with, too. Okay. Um, Keanu Warren is running for city council in uh, Chester, uh, Pennsylvania. I know the incineration is a big issue, but uh, Kearney, you want to tell us a little bit about your campaign? And you have to come off of mute. There you go. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kearney Warren. I am a new green. Um, I live in Chester, Pennsylvania, as Mark has said. Um, and my campaign, one of the um, my, one of my major concerns is the environmental racism that's taking place in Chester. So my platform is climate justice is racial, racial justice. Um, I am a former SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania organizer. So another issue for me is um, healthcare. Um, I've been a home care worker, family home care worker for 20 years off and on. So 
I just want to talk about the Covanta incinerator. And this is um, a huge, huge um, piece of my campaign. The Covanta incinerator located in Chester is the nation's largest waste incinerator. Um, it operates with the fewest pollution controls. Uh, it operates with only two of the four um, uh, standards, uh, safety standards set in place. Um, it's, Chester has been named one of the worst cases of environmental racism in the United States. Um, it's our largest air polluter and the largest environmental violator. Um, it's one of the top air polluters in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, our incinerator burns up to roughly 3,500 tons of, of municipal and industrial waste every day. Um, and Covanta is primarily located in cities that are predominantly Black, like Chester, Camden, New Jersey, and um, Newark, New Jersey. 30% of the burning trash becomes toxic ash, and it makes landfills more dangerous for groundwater. Um, the other 70% becomes air pollution. So the toxic ash from the incinerator um, in Delaware Valley is dumped in the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority's Rolling Hills Landfill in Berks County, Pennsylvania. The children in Chester, we have a high rate of um, asthma and asthma-related asthma hospitalizations. Um, the rate is four times the state average. Um, residents like myself are 50% more likely to die from brain disease and 25% more likely to die from heart disease than the rest of the residents in Delaware County. Our infant mortality rate um, is some of the worst in the state. Um, we are two to three times the state average, and we have the second lowest birth rates um, in the state. And the top contributors to this health crisis is the pollution from the daily burning of trash throughout the, the county. Um, so the people who are located in that area where Covanta is located, I have family there. Um, they cannot come outside on hot summer days, um, not just because the air is thick, but because of the the, the, the toxic air, um, and then the particles that come down from burning. So neighbors, residents in that area have to um, clean their cars, their, their uh, porch furniture um, is covered with, with, that, um, with that ash as well. Um, um, incineration and burying toxic ash in the landfills is far worse, I'm sure you all know, than using landfills directly um, and with Covanta, only six of the 105 jobs go to Chester residents. Most of the executives, if not all, live at least 10 miles outside um, Chester. You know, while we're the residents are, are suffering from the salt of air pollution, odors, and noise. The, the odor, it's a horrible stench. It stinks. It, it makes you physically ill. And on the weekends, it's for whatever reason, I don't know if that's when the trash, more trash comes to be burned, but it's, <clears throat> it's the worst. And residents um, have normalized that smell, not knowing what it is. They just thought, oh, well, this is the way it smells down here because of one of the uh, companies, not understanding that it's affecting, um, affecting us uh, with cancer. Um, I, two of my Family members who live there have cancer. My mother has died with cancer. Um, when we got the uh, testing from her tumor back, it was not hereditary and it was not because of what she ate. I specifically asked, was it environmentally related? And they said they would have to, that's why they're testing. Um, at this point, you know, we can't prove individually why people are getting cancer, but we do know that cancer is one of the health horrible health side effects um, caused by um, Covanta's air pollution. Um, Pennsylvania has been the largest importer of trash, pulling waste from Canada down through Puerto Rico. We get New York's trash, we get Oklahoma's trash, we get Canada's trash, we get Ocean City, Maryland's um, trash. We get 21 counties in Pennsylvania, they trash from 21 counties in um, Pennsylvania and um, New York. And this is because of a surplus of landfill 
uh, capacity that the state has permitted. A good thing is that we did win a huge win last week, um, last Wednesday. Myself, along with another organization member and Delco allies within Delaware County, we attended a uh, Upper Darby um, Town County Council meeting. The reason why we were there is because for 30 years, Upper Darby's trash has been burned in Chester. Upper Darby is the largest municipality in Delaware County where I'm located. So we went to this, this meeting to try to get them to pass a zero waste resolution and they passed it after months and months and months of fighting. So we had a victorious week last week. We were so very happy because it's a step in the right direction that um, they will curtail um, the, the, the amount of trash being produced and they're gonna work towards waste prevention and with reduction, reuse, recycling um, and composting in hopes that you know racial justice is, is in, um, climate justice, which is care, um, justice, jobs. So hopefully it will create um, more cleaner jobs um, than what we have now. Well, th thank you, uh, Kearney. Uh, one thing I'll mention, um, my local climate group, we have done a demonstration nine Tuesdays in a row against Congressman Paul Tonko, who is the lead person in the House of Representatives on, on climate, particularly on the Pelosi side. And his clean future bill incentivizes garbage incineration. Uh, and that's going to be a big fight in Congress. There's a lot of bad uh, climate solutions that they're doing. Our, our last speaker, uh, I see she has joined us, is Maureen Doyle, who is, uh, and then we're going to open it up to questions and responses and ideas and brainstorming. But it's Maureen Doyle, who is uh, the Green Party, Green Rainbow Party from Holyoke, Massachusetts, is on our local conservation council. And uh, uh, Maureen, you want to say a few words? Hmm. Maureen, can you, um, trying to see if I can find you and mute, uh, unmute you. She doesn't appear to be muted. Okay, yeah, Maureen, oh, I, well, it does, okay, let's see, yes, unmute, no. Well, maybe Maureen, I don't know, has gone out to do something. Her mic, who knows. Um, so why don't we open it up to questions or comments, and then Maureen comes back to the phone. Um, we'll have her join in. Actually, uh, Maureen has a, hi, sorry I'm late. Does anyone know about environmental justice towns? I learned about EJ designations when we were trying to close a Casella dump in our town, being an EJ town, opens the town city up to grants and other help. Check it out if you are working against a corporation preying on your town. Uh, there's also a mention of Mike Ewall, former, um, or maybe still Green is formerly on the platform committee, as executive director of Energy Justice Network. So, uh, and they uh, put, they posted the uh, information, the URL in the chat. Right. Well, I, I do know in New York State, because we've been finding some of these similar problems, you can get designated as an environmental justice community, and it does give you a little bit extra protection and then also hopefully funding. Um, but in some of the permit renewals we're doing, for instance, on a, commercial hazardous waste incinerator across the street from a public housing project in Cohoes, New York, you know, they've been designated as an EJ community and that gives them a little bit more of a clout. Um, I, I guess if people want to ask questions or make comments, you want to post your name in the chat room so we can follow it. So I, I don't know if people can raise their hands, but. Raise I'll try to help. Um, yeah, that would be helpful. While we're getting ready. I actually have a question. Um, because one thing I was hoping to hear are, you know, I've heard a lot about people's experience with specific issues in their towns that may or may not, you know, many of us are running into something similar. But I'm wondering, and I, I, I don't know if this link ever did work for you, Mark. I sent something that was for an environmental website run by a former green with very green content. But I was wondering about actual legislation or policies and specific issues. Uh, uh, for instance, like the famous plastic bag ordinance that was adopted in San Francisco uh, or Bay County or whatever, um, which was a green uh, created uh, policy. Uh, right. Any policies like that? And the other thing you did mention um, uh, possibilities like getting certain things designated certain ways. 
uh, are, is there any place uh, where one can go to find directions to do that? You know, how can I take actual political action uh, against or for certain things? Well, I, I, I mean, one thing um, in the 2014 gubernatorial election, um, Howie Hawkins got 5% of the vote for governor, um, which is the highest in the century of a progressive third party candidate. Um, and we have been part of the grassroots campaign to uh, ban fracking in New York state. And shortly after the election, Governor Cuomo agreed to ban fracking. And w one of the things that I you know, decided to do was it's easy to mobilize people to fight bad things. It is very difficult to mobilize people to fight for good things because without the threat to their their life and their communities and their children, there's not that level of motivation. And, and part of the problem is if you only fight bad things, it's whack-a-mole. Once you defeat one bad thing, a bad thing pops up someplace else. You have to build an alternative structure to replace them. So we, after the 2014 gubernatorial election, did three things. During the gubernatorial, um, during the anti-fracking fight, um, Mark Ruffalo got uh, this Professor Mark Jacobson and Professor Sir Cornell to develop a plan to go to 100%. We could go to New York State, 100% clean energy, zero emissions by 2030. And so we developed a piece of legislation to do that. Um, we actually had more sponsors than the other piece of legislation, but they had all the money behind it. And the other bill, which is much weaker, 2050 rather than 2030, um, weak on just transition is the one that was adopted. And we also went out and um, I wrote the divestment bill after that and got that into the state legislature. And then we also uh, wrote a carbon tax bill. So we wrote three pieces of legislation coming out of that 2014 piece of legislation. And you also mentioned um, the plastic bag issue. I, I know the uh, Green Party in Brooklyn held the first big meeting uh, in New York City, and it was actually from a woman from California who turned out not to be so good on plastic bags, but she'd been one of the lead people um, in, in California to do that. And long, long story, but basically last year we finally got a plastic ban, bag ban enacted in, in New York State. My wife happens to run a national coalition now on, on, on plastic issues, and she has developed legislation on plastic bags uh, ban in stores, which we just won in New York City, and one other thing. So she has developed some model piece of legislation. Um, the, I had cited earlier the uh, report by um, Bethlehem's Tomorrow, and that really pulled together a lot of the good climate policies ideas, you know, around uh, the country. Um, you know, would it be helpful to to try to identify who are the progressive policy wonks that have pulling together legislation. Perhaps if people tell us what legislation they might be interested in, we can help sort of track that down. But do any of the other speakers or the panelists, and I, and I do see that um, Mary Sanders is on stack and, and then Tony, but does anybody else want to try to answer Holly's question? Before I can also butt in here, um, I'll, I'll try to see if I can, I don't know if that link I sent, it, it never did go somewhere, but that was a, a good, sample legislation. I have, first of all, I have more on stack, just so you know, Anna Schiefelbein of Illinois, Gloria yeah. Matera of New York, Lorraine Luriano has a comment. I'm wondering if there are archives in the, in the Green Party to inform candidates of successful community campaigns on various environmental programs, Mary Sanders and then Tony Endege. Okay. So um, who's first on stack? I have Anna Schiefelbein. First, okay. Yeah. And thanks for saying my name correctly without uh, a big concern over it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up with that. Um, I'm mean, with the Illinois Green Party and we have Action Network. And so we get to do petitions and letter campaigns uh, and fundraisers all on day one. And we're taking a more community approach um, with our candidates. I'm also a candidate. Um, and so we are working more with the community and then we are taking advantage of this political energy, um, this urgency of climate action. Um, and we're at uh, physical events, we're at protests. Um, so we are trying to play 
all sides of the board um, in order to try to get ahead. 2022 is going to be a very um, advantageous year for us. And so we are just trying to do everything that we can to be part of the community that we hopefully will represent um, soon. Um, let's see, we have also, let's see, I guess Mary Sanders was on before uh, the rest, but Mary Sanders and Gloria Matera, a comment by Lorraine and then Tony. So Mary Sanders. Hi, um, all right, yeah. Mike, okay, my name is Mary Sanders. I'm in Hartford, Connecticut, capital of Connecticut, which recently eliminated plastic bags for the most part. Uh, of course, a couple stores have come up with ways to create one a little tiny bit thicker and sell them for 20 cents. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, they'll, they'll always find a way. But my comments are around environmental justice and I appreciated the comments about, you know, waste being dumped and burned in, in um, low income communities, primarily of color because that's uh, why I didn't grow up in Hartford. I grew up in the town um, shortly uh, away, um, but in the housing development. And, you know, we were right across the street from a large factory and nobody's talking about it, but we have had so many deaths of people from breast cancer from for women who grew up in that neighborhood, with, you know, with me. Um, and actually my sister still lives there, but every time I mention it, no, shut up, shut up, don't make trouble. Um, but anyway, here in Hartford, Connecticut, I, I campaigned a couple of years ago for state rep because there was a vacancy. So I jumped in, uh, I got 50 votes. Following year, I ran for city council, I got 400 votes. Last year I ran for Senator, I got um, about a thousand votes, which ended up being 3.5%. Um, of course, you know, um, I spent under a thousand dollars. So my, my votes cost about a dollar a vote. Whereas the winner, a 22-year incumbent, his votes cost him like $13 a piece, according to what he spent on his campaign. Um, but with the, I campaigned heavily on the issue of our waste facility, which was, has been falling apart for years. We were successful many years ago in shutting down a landfill and everything. We, we also receive um, trash from 23 towns around us. So everything comes here to Hartford and is recycled and then burned. But our recycling is a, is a farce because, you know, I, I mean, I have a house full of stuff. I want to get to the recycling center myself because a lot of the trucks end up bringing stuff straight to incineration because it's com um, contaminated. So I campaigned on, on an education um, platform uh, around, you know, reuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And also campaigned at that time in favor of some money that was up being, you know, voted on at the state capitol to upgrade our facility. And the owner and operator of this facility had came in with a really good blueprint, which was gonna reduce pollution by about 85, 90% by having a proper recycling um, facility and better filters and better a better way of incineration, which I was in favor of because I hate the thought of my garbage being buried in another state. And that's the alternative. Well, they didn't give the guy the money and our, our um, facility is scheduled to be closed next July. The surrounding towns that are still sending their trash to us, I don't know if they're paying attention to this. I don't know what the plan is here, but once that facility closes, all, our, all the trash is either gonna have to be disposed of an, another way or is supposedly gonna be shipped to Pennsylvania for future generations to deal with. What do you guys recommend, if not incineration, and what can I campaign on next year? <laughs> Thank you. Well, Mary, um, in Chester, um, we're we're pushing uh, zero waste. Um, I can put a link to the resolution that we just recently got passed, or re the resolution that was recently passed to move to um, waste prevention um, where the businesses and universities, colleges, government agencies in, you know, in cities will um, begin to move to uh, zero waste. Also, I just wanted to mention composting. Um, if you have facilities that are already doing recycling, you can, petition to have them switch to composting. And so if they have public 
areas or they they start using that that's one step in the right direction obviously zero waste is ideal uh that's ideal for sure but if you could start um usually composting is a at least economical approach that um uh, most businesses and um you know jurisdictions will be willing to initiate initiate sorry <clears throat> I see that. Let's see. I have Gloria next, and then um, there's others. So I have Gloria, a uh, comment by or question by Lorraine Loriano, and then Tony and Dege. And I'm checking for more. But thanks, Holly. Um, well, I mean, it's great to see all these candidates and, and hear some of the issues that you're taking up in your in your areas. And you know, you want to acknowledge Mark. Um, we're very lucky in New York to have Mark and all the work that he's been doing. And the knowledge he has. Um, I've been a candidate a few times before. I also worked under Mark uh, in the Stein campaign in 2016. Um, but I'd like to kind of suggest I know sometimes local Greens running for local office because we're Greens like to bring in like a lot of the, you know, national, international kind of issues. And um, what I'm hearing now is kind of people looking at more locally. And I think that's great. I think the connection though is helpful if. We always talk about the Green New Deal as this, and we, many of us like to say the eco-socialist Green New Deal um, as an kind of an overarching campaign theme where then you can talk about like how that gets realized um, in your localities, right? And a lot about public ownership, which some of the speakers have talked about, which I think is really important and distinguishes um, Green Party candidates from other candidates. And so I think that you know, staying so focused on how things can happen locally, but always talking about the bigger picture, um, about the Green New Deal, about public ownership, um, and the kinds of things that I think that, you know, the Green Party presents in a way that shows we have, it's not just that we're candidates campaigning on environmental issues. Um, there are dozens and dozens of Democrats that call me up as, as a chairperson here in New York for the Green Party and say, well, I like the environment. So would you, you know, the Green Party be willing to endorse me? It's really, you know, the the bigger picture that the Green Party has and kind of the issues around sustainability, around public ownership uh, that I think are important to emphasize. So good luck, candidates. Lorraine Loriano, anyone wanted to take, I'll see, I'll read this. She asked, I'm, work, I'm wondering if there are archives and the Green Party to inform candidates of successful community campaigns on various environmental campaigns. Um, and I know, of course, there on the website there are articles and news pieces and such, but um, maybe Echo Action has something that you're collecting. It's a good idea, not that I'm aware of. Okay. That was, uh, let's see, the next person was Tony Ndege. I don't know if there's anybody else who was trying to get on the stack, um, post it again, because I don't know that I or anybody has seen it. So Tony. De Delilah just p p says she wants to be on stack. Okay, okay, Tony and then Delilah. So I'm gonna say something a little contentious. <laughs> um, so this like, um, a lot of folks, um, have had issues with, well, you know, a big thing that our party in terms of public pub PR, as, as, as uh, Gloria mentioned, is the concept of green, especially, you know, corporations just using green over and over and over and greenwashing and corporate, you know, Earth Day fairs and what have you um, has kind of left a sour taste in people's mouths in terms of like, you know, um, what, you know, green means, what, what you know, ecologically sound things uh, mean, as well as, um, you know, some folks see things like uh, plastic bag bans as being regressive in a way, in terms of if there's like a, well, a ban is a ban, but like if there's like, you know, in California, there's like pretty substantial tax. I'm pretty sure this is in several other states if you get a bag. Um, and some folks see it kind of regressive for people who have to like either, either catch the bus or something like that, you know, where you, you, you know, don't all, you, you, your life is packed with like working and getting from one thing to another. 
And um, sometimes there's a little bit of resentment of, of, in terms of like these kinds of like band-aids, in my opinion, to the issue um, as, as being against poor people. Um, I know that's something that we don't talk about always, but I think it's something that, that uh, there's people who, who feel this, like that there's a divide. Um, would any of our, our candidates like to address that or anyone, you know, an audience or uh, speakers uh, over? Yeah, I, I would like to address that. Uh, I, I spent my entire professional career as an anti-poverty organizer, uh, initially as ACORN in, uh, in Texas, among other places. Uh, and then for 28 years, I ran a statewide anti-hunger group and was the lead group on welfare rights and stuff like that. Um, a lot of groups in New York City were very resentful of people who raised the issue that um, a so-called fee on plastic bags, uh, if you didn't bring returnables, would, would be regressive. Um, they say you act like low-income people are not concerned about the environment. You act like low-income people uh, aren't concerned about what goes on in their community with litter, and you act like low-income people aren't able to respond um, to these type of situations, probably we respond better. And, you know, so they, they fought very hard against that uh, particular argument. What we've also done in New York City and New York State um, was that we exempted any purchases made uh, with food stamps or WIC from the plastic bag stuff. But anti-poverty groups in New York State were very vocal that they supported uh, getting rid of plastic bags. Any other comments? We have uh, Delilah on next. Okay, hi, thanks again. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm really tired and I woke up and I've been working all day, so I'm a little not with it, but um, I have a question and then I have a comment to make. Um, I think some people find the term eco-socialism divisive and uh, like we, even within my own state party, they're like, we don't like the term socialism because we, you know, we're in Texas. And I was like, all we have to do is make that term um, easier for everybody to understand. That's like part of our role is to make, you know, offer education to people and, and inform them about our party and what we're doing. Um, but nevertheless, I do, I obviously identify as an eco-socialist and uh, try my best to work with other uh, parties and get out as much as possible. I did want to make the recommendation that the YES caucus members are very adept. And if they are in your state, you should do your best to reach out to them because they have a lot of good methods for reaching other people and getting your message out. So um, like we're trying to get more members into our YES caucus. Um, I just, I think they're a really resilient group and, you know, they're all young, so it's like they have a different perspective than a lot of us do. So I think it's important to just keep them in mind. And as far as campaigning goes, the most success I've had, you know, I'm a working class person. I've worked in surgery for 18 years and I have no problem, regardless of political background, um, making strides with people as long as we make it a working class issue. And, and uh, working and poor people issue because everything that we are struggling with affects us the most. And so it's just an easy way to kind of break the ice if you're finding that people are a little bit resistant to having these conversations that are obviously really important. The question I have to um, other longtime Greens is, what do you do with such, you know, we talk about resources a lot and how they're important. And we, you know, one of the most important resources is people and having people to help you and having people to work with. What do you do when you're lacking in that department? Like we don't have the resources for a state as large as Texas. And we have been trying so hard to get people in and it's just, it, it feels like we don't have any resources. So other than like fundraising, do you guys have any ways that you recommend to kind of overcome that barrier? Emma Stack. Mark Stack. Anna, go ahead. And then Mark. 
Yeah, so we found that we can do virtual phone banking. Um, not only, you know, get the training and everything together, but people are comfortable between three, giving them three to five phone numbers and then following up with them, um, you know, every couple of weeks just to check in. Um, we have some free data from the March for Medicare for All. And so we're still working with that list. And so it's like, it's not really our data. So we don't really, <laughs> we can give it away without somebody having to sign an NDA to it. Um, but, um, so I think that is really engaging, that's COVID friendly people, it's a doable task and it gets people, um, it gets people activated. So that's one thing that we've been doing. Thank you. I mean, what, I mean, I've been a candidate, I think five or six times at this point and probably ran about 20 other campaigns. Couple of things. One is that I have found for local races, uh, the Green Party usually was able to out raise the Democrats, um, New York City being a big exception. But in fact, for for small races, you know, we can match the other parties uh, in terms of resources. And that's, you know, that's being disciplined about fundraising. And, you know, Ralph Nader always complained that Greens don't know how to ask for money and we feel guilty about it. And by far, Ralph is the best person I've encountered in the Greens in terms of doing fundraising. Um, he will not leave you, let you leave the room until he has raised the amount of money that he wants. And none of us um, have that type of discipline. Um, and I've also found that in a lot of races, after the races, the Democrat and I, oh my God, we've had no volunteers in the race. It's been pathetic. We've only got a half a dozen people out on the weekend. And the Democrats come to me after the race and say, oh my God, you had an army of volunteers out there. I, we've never seen anything like that. Uh, um, and, and so it's, it's much harder, of course, when you're trying to do that in the presidential race, you know, where people get really excited. It's a lot easier in the local races. Um, you know, first thing I learned as a community organizer is that the first time you, when you meet somebody, you ask them to volunteer to do something and you ask them to do something small, come in and you know, in the old days, you know, stuff envelopes or do one little thing, because once they take that first step, they're much more committed to taking, you know, the next steps. And I think Anna talked about the virtual um, you know, phone banking, certainly texting these days seems to be an easier way for people um, to reach that. But I think the broader problem is that, and this goes way beyond the Eco Action Committee, is that, uh, you know, th there isn't a lot of immediate rewards in our political system to Green Party candidates getting two to five or even 10 percent of the vote. And therefore, it's hard to get people to feel it's worthwhile, especially year after year after year. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think the Greens should be a lot more active on issues. And a lot of Greens are individually active on issues, but often don't identify themselves as being Greens when they do that work. But you know, if you're not going to provide the other reinforcement to people for being involved with the campaigns, A, you're not usually winning the election, especially partisan elections. In New York State, Pretty much everything is partisan. I know it's a lot easier to win nonpartisan races in a lot of places around the country. Local races are nonpartisan. That's not true in New York. So we have a much more um, you know, difficult time. But if you build up that relationship with other groups by actually doing work on issues and not just asking for their support on election day, I think they're much more likely to support you. And I think a lot of groups get really confused. It's sort of like, my platform is exactly the platform that you articulate on your particular issue. Why aren't you supporting the Green Party candidate in our election? Because they don't see what the return is on that. And I, I, I think the Greens have to, you know, spend a little more time being, you know, and I mentioned, you know, working on other issues, but I know the Greens in Albany, we had a young green house, almost a communal house for about a decade. And they did things like, um, uh, food not bombs, you know, they did, you know, food delivery, food relief, they did a lot of community gardening, they did a lot of service oriented stuff. And I was at ACORN and also United Farm Workers Union. I mean, that was sort of one of the model, you, you did other things outside your organizing to, to build up that bond and relationships within that community. And then you could pull them into your, your greater political work. 
but it's very hard in the United States under, you know, especially for state level races like governor or, you know, presidential races or Senate races to provide that type of immediate reinforcement to, to people. We had that with, with Nader in 2000, we've not had it since. Just a couple more. Thank you. I'm sorry, a couple more stats. Lorraine uh, Lariano had another post and I see that Alejandro uh, had posted, but it looks like he's withdrawn the stack. Alejandro, if you're there, do you wanna go ahead? I can unmute you and um, you can go ahead and ask. Otherwise I'll read uh, Lorraine or Lorraine, do you want to, if Lorraine can. Um, oh, okay. Asking to unmute. Okay, so I'm not seeing that. And Lorraine, I'm not seeing. Go ahead. Good, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, is it Alejandro or, or myself? I guess yourself, because Alejandro is not, is not uh, if, if he unmutes, then, you can go, then he can go next. Uh, okay. So I guess my question was um, how can various environmental issues be linked? to heighten the connections between communities. Um, I've been really involved with the issue of Luma Energies and I did um, send it to Mark. Um, and I know that Luma Energy just recently received the contract uh, because in Puerto Rico, there was actually a public entity, the Autoridad Eléctrica de Energía. And that was dismantled uh, because you know, there's a fiscal control board that was set up by Congress and they gave this really lucrative um, contract to a company that was just created a year ago. They were created in January of 2020. They got the contract in June and they just started uh, being the energy contract. And so the problems with Luma is that <clears throat> Luma Energy has already spent about $162 billion and they are going to have a, a, a huge amount of money accessed by FEMA. And I think that this is inappropriate because there's no real plan for clean energy. And there's also the issue that workers have been displaced. The, uh, the, the active union uh, was displaced when they dismantled the public, um, the public utility. And so I'm just wondering um, what other communities uh, have something like this that has occurred that possibly Puerto Rico, um, you know, that this issue could be looked at and also advocated because we're looking at millions of dollars going to private companies that have no commitment to the people. We're talking about 44% of the people in Puerto Rico live under the poverty level and they're receiving bills that are of 150 or 200 dollars, right? And Luma um, is not being for forthright as to who are, where are their offices? They don't even have services that people that answer the phone in English, in Spanish, which is a language that's being spoken there. And on top of that, they're going to have access to all the reservoirs in the country the fiber optics, they're just being handed over everything to a monopoly. And I'm just wondering um, what other communities is within the United States? I mean, I think the Luma issue should be an issue for the Green Party in general, because there's so many levels of violations from workers' rights to the rights of energy and the fact that there is a coalition um, within communities that has offered an alternative that's not gonna cost $15 billion and will not like give all this money to something that's not even going to reconstruct the electrical grid. Um, so that's kind of my question. Um, I know it's huge, sorry, it's a huge issue, but thank you for listening to me. Oh, yeah, if I may, uh, Lorraine, that's a really important question to ask. Um, I know at least stateside, any groups that are um, abolitionists or against um, the prison industrial complex, you would find allies there because often these extractors hire police and those sort of private agents to protect themselves from, you know, people who are trying to um, protest and, and slow down their you know business interests so 
that, those groups are, are definitely going to be helpful. And also anybody that you can meet in the indigenous community are usually very um, well, they have the framework for organization for these type of things, because, you know, pipelines, all of this extraction is going around all over the nation, all over the world, and indigenous people are the ones leading the fight back. And they're happy for anybody to help them and they're happy to help other people for these types of um, efforts. So depending on where you are, I would look for those two groups, those advocates um, to, okay. to try and ally yourself with to get more people involved. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I, you so I, much. I, I mean, a couple of comments I, I, I would make. Um, I, I mean, one, whenever we talk about public power, um, I, I try to say we want public ownership and democratic control. And if you don't have the democratic control, then the public ownership is not going to be any good. Um, and we see that in New York with our statewide and the Long Island Power Authority. The, the, I mean, I think the other problem is that uh, most governments are corrupt um, and they steal whenever they can the taxpayer money for the benefit of the special interests. And I think Puerto Rico is a more extreme example of that as a legacy of colonialism, where basically it's been opened up for the wealthy from the North American continent to you know, rip apart the system. Um, I, I mean, one thing, unfortunately, is not going to work is a rational discussion about the problem. Um, because they know what the problem is and they're doing it because it's corruption and it's making money for people. And, you know, it, and I think in those type of situations, you need groups to put their bodies on the line, unfortunately, which is not an easy thing to do, but to say, this is not going to occur and we are going to physically, you know, try to stop it in a nonviolent um, manner. You have to make it a, you know, a crisis situation. And I know that a lot of groups in New York city, um, because of the role of Wall Street and this whole vulture funds that they've been doing in Puerto Rico have been, you know, trying to address it. And it gets a lot of publicity, but we, we don't tend, you know, to win it. It's a very, very tough fight, unfortunately, in, in, in Puerto Rico. And I don't pretend to be an expert on Puerto Rico. Yeah, I just know it, colonialism is a tough legacy to overcome. And, and and Holly, I, I would like like five minutes to wrap up. I was just gonna I was just gonna say we're we're getting close to the hour and a half point, so um, it doesn't seem like there's any other uh, questions yet. So yeah, why don't you go ahead? This is good timing. Yeah, I mean, so Eagle Action wants to help candidates, and you know we didn't come up with a lot of concrete things today. The one thing I had suggested was that um, you know Eagle Action could try to maybe do some press releases that talk about various issues and then how the candidates in various states or communities are, great. you know, working on that. And so it can be incineration or, or, or whatever, you know, that, um, you know, particular issue. Um, and if people, you know, do want, hey, I got a problem here and I want to solve it. I mean, that's something that EcoAction should be able to take and say, can, can we find a model <laughs> solution here from other places? And just among the candidates yourself, you know, somebody in Pennsylvania may be working on a solution that will play well in, you know, in Texas and just sort of sharing, um, you know, that that information. And just to the campaign coordinating committee, I, you know, we, you know, campaign schools are helpful. And we used to do a lot of them in New York. We haven't done too many, you know, in recent years, but the extent the campaign coordinating committee can come back. And I always say when I tell people, listen, if you're serious about winning, you have to do voter identification. There is no way you win without really strict voter identification. The other reality is in most cases, especially in a partisan race, you're not gonna win in terms of getting the majority of votes on election day. So you have to define for yourself, what is your victory? Is it to get New York State to divest from fossil fuels? Is it to shut down this incinerator? Is it to win a particular thing? And you define for yourself what that victory is or two victories or three victories, and then focus on that. And you have to have, you know, as a campaign, you have to have a written campaign plan with deadline and resources needed because that's the only way you ever accomplish it if you 
work your way backwards and figure out if I want to do this by this day, what do I need to have done by three weeks prior to that and, and, and six weeks you know, prior to this. So I do hope the coordinating campaign committee can help with that. But if, if any of the candidates have things that they think Eco Action can assist with, you know, ask. We may not be able to deliver, but if you ask, we can try to come up with an answer. And I don't know anybody else from Eco Action, Tony, or anybody else, Mary or Maureen, uh, want to chime in? A couple minutes left, but thank you. And we posted, you know, um, contact Echo Action directly, contact according to campaign committee, uh, YES group directly for further details or one of us and we will go and and um, ring doorbells and try to get in <laughs> and try to get answers. But uh, oh, one other thing I did want to mention on the climate issue. Um, one of the things I've been working with the Global Greens is COP26 is coming up in uh, November in, in Glasgow, assuming it doesn't get canceled because of COVID again, it was canceled last year. Um, this is viewed as the last chance COP. This is gonna be a particularly big fight about third world countries and then also reducing emissions. This will have a lot more attention as we get closer to November. And so the extent that the Greens are out front, at least talking about that, you know, it will pick up attention uh, as we get closer. And the other thing at the national level is this $3.5 trillion um, infrastructure green stimulus package that Schumer has passed, passed the house today, the 3.5 trillion. Every major climate group, all of whom have been fighting at least for a little bit more. We asked for 40 trillion. Most of the groups are asking for 10 trillion. Um, they settled on 3.5 trillion. Every other group pretty much has now jumped to defend the 3.5 trillion and has dumped asking for any more money. So the Greens are about the only ones left that's saying what you're doing with this is totally inadequate. Uh, and you know, we are the only ones that have the courage to stand up to say everybody else has now gone on the defensive. They treat in the 3.5 trillion as the ceiling and will negotiate downwards rather than trying to treat the 3.5 trillion as the floor and trying to push it upward a little bit. Thank you. On that well, note, thank you. Thank you guys for doing this and hope we'll be back and with more. Um, Mark, I should echo action, encourage people to talk up COP26, do letters to editors, Facebook posts, et cetera. Um, and we're almost out of time, but go ahead. And then maybe there's something more that, that Echo Action can put out with talking points. I, you guys do a really good job with talking points and, and, and stuff. Well, well, COP26 is doing that stuff. And I think I forget the exact date. Uh, I'll send it out. I think it's September 9th. Uh, they're doing another webinar, and it's particularly how people can participate uh, at the local level. Um, and they're having examples from around the world. The, their webinar is actually very interesting because it's the first time I've heard Greens. From, from Kenya and Argentina and Egypt and Lebanon, you know, talk about how they're doing. I will say I've discovered the Green Party of the United States is about the most progressive Green Party on the planet. There are some that can challenge us, but um, the rest of the Green Party is a little bit more moderate than us. But I will suggest to them that they should put out more talking points so that candidates, and I think they want to do it that, local greens can begin to amplify the COP26 message. But yes, you know, letters to the editor would be very helpful. Um, and the, uh, the Stop the Money Pipeline is one group that's running a national campaign right now around COP26. They're the one US group. I mean, a lot of groups have it on their radar, but, but the Stop the Money Pipeline is the one group that has a national campaign. Thank you. Well, thank you to our candidates. Yes, yeah, it's fantastic. You know. Yeah, thanks. This is really great. Good luck to everybody. Um, we'll see how things go. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, Sam Hales, the, the uh, URL for this uh, recording will be available in a couple of, we don't know how fast. Um, we might be able to get up faster, but I'll see if I can, uh, if, if I can uh, get the URL and share it via uh, Google. Um, you can't really email the whole file, but uh, Hillary, do you have, do you have anything to say? I posted the link um, for both our webinar archive and also the application for candidates um, to request for funding um, in the chat. So, um, so folks should have that um, 
Sam, I don't know what you mean about sharing the video and how that refer like relates to the application. There are two separate things. So tonight's video is recorded. It'll go on our website for just posterity. Anyone who missed it, S completely separately, we have an application for current candidates of all kinds, like of Greens, um, but anyone who's gonna be on the fall ballot to request support um, and money from the, the national party. Um, so those, those links are both in the chat. Um, I don't think we're going to do a webinar in September. Instead, we're going to do two different Facebook Lives with candidates. Um, so stay tuned for details. But uh, those are going to be September 14th and September 22nd. Um, and then we'll probably be back in October with our Get Out the Vote call. And then it'll be election day, uh, amazingly enough. So we're countdown to a couple more months and, and then that's it. So thank you all for um, participating. Thank you, Eco Action, Mark, Alejandro. Tony, George, Kearney, Delilah, um, Maureen, everyone. And um, thank you to the candidates for running. And I think that's it. We have one more late breaking thing. So just to know that, that uh, go ahead, Alejandro. Good question. Good question. Um, yeah. In regards to the funding for this year, is it only for 2021 candidates or is it yes. also for 2022? Nope. This year is only, for, we do it just for the year. So next year we'll fund okay. 2022. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. We'll be back next year. Thank you, everyone. And uh, good luck. Hope to hear great news coming up in November. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.